Hi everyone, and um, welcome to our, our webinar today. So you want to be a writer, an inside look at indie publishing. My name is Katherine Jones-Payne. I'm the managing editor of Quill Pen Editorial Services, and I am so happy to be able to introduce Katie Cross to you. She's the best-selling author of Miss Mabel's School for Girls. Um, we're actually working on um, getting the editing done for the third and the third book that, that is set in this wonderful, wonderful world that she's created. And if you want a free introduction to some of her work, she's actually doing a Wattpad novel right now called Bonbons to Yoga Pants. Um, did I get the title on that right? Yep, yep, that's it. It's free to read and doesn't require a sign up. And it's a lot of fun. So you should definitely go check that out. Um, and so today we just wanted to um, just talk a little bit about what it really is like to be an indie writer um, and to go over some things that Katie says that she wished that she had known um, and some things that my clients have told me that they wished that they had known when they got started in this process. So we're, we're really excited about that. Again, thank you so much for coming out. And we want to start by thinking what a, a typical day in the life of an indie author looks like. Now, as as any indie author will tell you, and I'm sure Katie will be no exception, no two days in the life of an indie author look exactly alike because um, there's there's always always something new that you're doing with the day. Um, but she was gracious enough to outline a, a typical Monday for us recently, um, and so I'll I'll let her talk to you guys about. What, what that sometimes looks like for her. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that intro, Catherine. Um, this is going to be really exciting. So first of all, when I first started out as an indie author, especially when I started doing this full time, um, one of my biggest questions was, how do, how do people break down their day? Like, what exactly does it look like? How much are they writing? Are they working on one? A manuscript at a time, how do they fit real life in between writing and marketing and working? So I've given you an example of a typical Monday. Monday is typically my busiest day because I take a break over the weekend. Um, and so Monday, I typically have a really long list of things I thought to do over the weekend. So this is just a, an example, as Catherine said, not every Monday looks like this and not every single day will look like this. But I wake up at about 6.30 every um, pretty much every day, sometimes even on the weekend, it's just kind of how my, my biological clock works. Um, let my dogs out, get breakfast, kind of wake up. I log into social media, like Facebook, Twitter, that kind of thing, about 6.45. I always think it's important to stay in touch with my audience, no matter who, much, who that is. Um, so I'm always responding to Facebook comments and tweets and that sort of thing. Uh, I just do that for 15 or 20 minutes. I just like to see how the social media seems going. And then I start writing right away by 7 o'clock. Every Monday and Thursday, I post a chapter on my Wattpad story, Bonbons to Yoga Pants, that Catherine was talking about. So by 7 o'clock, I start writing that next chapter that goes live that morning. It takes me about an hour to write it, polish it, get as many, catch as many errors as I can, and then post that chapter to Wattpad, and then share it to social media. So by the time I've finished with Wattpad and, and posted that chapter and responded to comments on Wattpad and that sort of thing, I start answering my emails at about 8.15. Uh, as a basic basic number, I get about 100 unread emails every morning. Those vary to anything from social media notifications or blog posts from blogs that I follow, or even like emails from my cover designer, my um, developmental editors, Catherine, or anyone who's commented on my blog. M my emails range even to my mortgage. So I kind of go through those every morning. Um, and that takes about an hour to start sorting through those, responding, kind of putting out fires, that kind of thing. By 9.15, I try and start, I try and start working by 9 or 9.30 every day on my current work in progress, um, which is, has been lately Mildred's resistance. I was finishing up the, the developmental edits and getting it ready for line and copy edits. So I would try and edit, work through about 100 pages, which takes me anywhere depending on how much I need to change and fix from an hour to two hours. So by about 10.45 or 11, I need a break for my brain between writing Bon Bon's Yoga Pants and Mildred's Resistance Editing and emails is about ready to, to explode at about that point. So I um, exercise is really important for me and my husband. So I will take my dogs on a hike or I'll do a weight lift or something of that sort to get my mind off of writing completely. By noon, 
I grab something to eat and I start a different project. So I start outlining um, a book that I haven't written yet, which for me is the fourth and final book in the network series. Then after I've outlined part of that, I will actually go back and write anywhere from two to 4,000 words on that first draft of what I've just outlined. Typically that will take me anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours, sometimes three if I really get going. But by about 1.30, I'm ready to take another creative break because outlining is exhausting for me. So I eat lunch, I watch an episode of The Office or Roseanne or, or some TV show so I can shut my mind off of writing for a while. And then I give myself about half an hour to an hour, and then I start on another project by about two. So I'm going to start editing the second draft of the next book that's coming up in the network series, which is called The Ambassador's Assistant. And I'll do that for about two hours. Um, by then, I like remember that I also have other responsibilities in my life outside writing. So I do the dishes, I clean my house, I start dinner, I vacuum, I play with my dogs, I check the mail, I do all that kind of normal stuff. Um, by 4.35, I like to start checking social media again, um, start interacting, sharing people's posts, that kind of stuff. And by 5 o'clock, I am ready to start working on actual business, like I have invoices I have to pay or give away books from Goodreads that I need to address and mail, or I just hired an accountant and we've been coordinating a lot on taxes because they were just due. I check my sales then. I've been working with um, Kobo Writing Life to start a new promotional activity for Miss Mabel, so I've been trying to coordinate that and um, updating my websites, all that kind of stuff. So that business chunk of time when I'm not writing, but I'm trying to move Antebellum Publishing and all of my books forward, I typically need to dedicate about an hour and a half to two hours to um, at least two or three times a week. That's not every day. Uh, a lot of the time that, that can be done in big chunks. So I don't want anyone out there to think that I have to do business stuff like three hours a day, because that would be crazy. Um, so by, by the time my husband gets home around 6.30 or 7, I'm definitely ready for a break. We'll eat dinner, my husband and I will talk about the day, play with our dogs again, sometimes take them on another walk. And often, um, I'll actually go back and start writing again by about 8 or 9 o'clock until I go to bed around 10 or 11. But that's just because um, I'm on like hyperdrive trying to get my books written before we have a baby in August. And so my schedule is, is even busier than normal. Um, so basically, that's just kind of a basic breakdown of how I structure my day as an indie author. Um, I need breaks in between creative time because it, it's very mentally and emotionally draining to constantly be creative. I know some people can write up to six hours a day without a problem, but I am definitely not one of those. Um, and I don't think people out there, should, yeah, I think people out there should not feel like they have to do that. So, Absolutely. And one more thing that I really wanted to add on. Um, as you know, as we're looking at the schedule, and Katie, you know, she she has a very disciplined schedule, um, and she she has a lot of projects going on at once, and that that's one of the things that makes her such an effective author. But you know, if you're the sort of person that just if you drag yourself out of bed at 6:30, then you're dead to the world and grumpy for the rest of the day. You know, don't don't feel like you have to fit yourself in a particular in a particular um, mold. Find find what works for you. Find the best time when you are creative and really work at maximizing that. Um, Definitely. It's Definitely. always a personalized process. And I will I will even echo that. There's a there's another indie author that I just love, Stephanie Car Carfelt. She writes really, really good books. And you know, she's a night owl. She will put up like statuses on Facebook that she'll do all night writes and she'll stay up from like 11 to 4 just writing because that's her creative time like she's a powerhouse then but I'm like a powerhouse in the morning that's why I always do my most important work at like 8 to 9 in the morning because that's when I'm best so it's just different for everyone really and you kind of have to figure that out for yourself exactly and the really important thing is to just make sure that you you keep yourself to a pretty disciplined schedule where regardless of when you do the different things in the day and um, the important things do get done um, and I think we've all been guilty of those days when we started out to do a lot of work and ended up on Netflix the whole day. But <laughs> yeah. the, the important thing is to get, get yourself in a rhythm where you don't have those days very often, um, and you can really get a lot of work done on the novel, on the business aspects of being a writer, and, and just get to consistently um, get the work done that you need to do. Definitely. 
All right, so we wanted to, um, on the next subject we want to address is um, building, building your dream team because books are never produced in a vacuum, or at least, you know, really good books are never produced in a vacuum. Um, you have a team that you work alongside. You have your editors, you have a cover artist. Um, if, you, if you want to produce print, bro print books and not just eBooks, you're going to have a typesetter. Um, like Katie was saying a few minutes ago, um, as, as the business side of it grows, you might need to have an accountant. Um, and so as you're, as you're putting together a team, you're going to be working with a number of different professionals to do that. And particularly when you're building the creative side of your team, um, the most important thing I would say is always look for people with good word of mouth recommendations. So if you're, if you're not sure who you want to contact for editing or to do your cover art, you know, email, email writers that you really admire, um, independent writers that you admire, and ask them who did their editing, who did their cover art. Um, you know, if, if, you see, if you see someone whose book is exceptionally beautiful on the inside, you can see that they, um, they worked with a typesetter, typesetter that was really talented. Ask them for that name and who that was. And go on to ask, ask them specific questions. You know, ask if the professional that they were working with um, is, are they consistent? Do they tend to meet deadlines? Or at the very least, you know, communicate when they have to push back the deadline by a day or two. Um, getting, getting word of mouth recommendations is going to be the single biggest thing you can do to make sure that you're connecting yourself with competent um, professional uh, people who will really help you craft the best version of your book. Um, another thing I would say is when you reach out to these professionals, um, getting quotes, getting samples, you want to make sure that they're really passionate about the books that they work with. Um, you know, for, for a cover artist, um, cover art shouldn't just be a career or something that they do because it seems to be a good way to make some extra pocket change. You know, it needs, it needs to be something that they absolutely love doing, love engaging engaging with books and engaging with the design aspects of books. Um, you want someone who is also a, a positive person who will exude a positive vibe. Um, as I'm sure Katie can attest, sometimes the editing process can be a little bit difficult. You'll, you'll get um, editors sending, uh, sending you um, evaluations where they say a lot of a lot of things that could come off as negative, areas that you need to work on to create a really professional polished project. Um, and you want to find someone who can, who can do that, um, but who is upbeat and encouraging and who really believes in you and your book. Um, it's, I think that it, it makes it a lot easier to, to hear that you need to improve your book in this area or that area um, when the person is coming from a place of wanting to see you succeed um, and wanting to give you give you encouragement even as they tell you areas that that need to be critiqued but at the same time you also need to be with someone who's willing to be brutal and is willing to tell you when they think that you are making a mistake with a particular scene um, or you know particular a particular character um, you you need someone whose judgment you trust and who's willing to be honest about that and isn't going to just be a, a yes man and approve of everything that you're doing. Um, you, you definitely want someone who, um, who will critique you on that. Um, is, Katie, is there anything that you would, you would want to add in particular when you're looking for building a dream team? Um, you know, the only thing I want to add that it pertains a lot to indies right now is um, the fact that a lot of indies actually don't necessarily have a team, not necessarily because they, they don't want one, but either because they just want to try and do it all themselves, which, which is certainly something you can do, or, you know, because they are able to do it themselves. Um, so, for example, I know plenty of indies that just format and typeset their own books for publication, and, you know, it works for them. They know Adobe really well, and they feel comfortable and confident doing that or they're just natural, they know graphic design really well and they make their own covers and it saves them a lot of money, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That, that happens and I don't think we should ignore that. And I'm not saying that you should build up a team as extensive as the one that I have is, but you also need to take into account the fact that 
having a team frees you up to write and you should always be writing. The number one thing you should always be doing is writing. So I have a typesetter, I have a cover designer, I have several editors, I have an accountant, I have all those people, not because I can't do it myself, but because they make my books look more professional and because then I can write. So that that is really one of the main important parts of a team. So we're not here to say, oh, you can't do it yourself, because you can, and people do, and they still are very successful. But you also have to weigh, weigh into account how much professionalism you're willing to sacrifice to save a little bit of money and, and put off, you know, maybe put off the book release for a little bit to save some more money to pay for professional or, um, you know, you know, just do it all yourself. So it's just something to keep in mind as an indie that some people don't always think of at first. Exactly. The one caveat I would add to that, and I'm, you know, I'm an editor, I'm biased this way. I would say that pretty much every indie writer should have an editor, you know, Absolutely. At least an editor who will um, read through it um, and, and point, point at anything that just really doesn't work because even, even the most talented writers um, can't see their own plot holes. They can't see their own typos. Um, the, we're, when you're so caught up, in something, um, it it can be difficult to see things objectively. Um, and the reason I actually recommend working with more than one editor is sometimes if you just have one editor, um, you know, they can become as invested in the book as you are, and so it can be hard for them to do some of the later stages of editing. Um, like I will never copy edit a book that I've done developmental online editing for, um, and that's that's just because I wouldn't trust myself to catch all the typos at that point when I'm that familiar with the book and that invested in the book. Um, but yes, absolutely echoing everything Katie just said, um, except that I really do think that not needing an editor would be a, a rare mm -hmm. to never happening case. Oh yeah, and, and really most of what I say applies to everything but editing. I mean, I did my own typesetting at first for Miss Mabel's. I ended up hiring a guy who made it so beautiful, I'll never try and do it again. You know, cover design, some people do find themselves, but an editor you absolutely have to have. I mean, you absolutely have to have. Catherine did a developmental edit for me on my last book that was positive, but it was like seven and a half pages of changes that she suggested that once I read through, I was like, oh my gosh, she pointed out like four plot holes I didn't even see that completely changed how I looked at my book. And it would have been a disaster had I published without her insight. So I would I never know, ever. Disaster. Oh, it would have been a disaster with my <laughs> other fans because I just had all these plot holes and inconsistencies I didn't see because I'm too involved. So an editor is an absolute, absolute, absolute must. All right. So the, the other thing that we wanted to address as you're building your dream team um, is what, what happens when you figure out that there's a member of your team that for whatever reason you can't continue to work with. Um, and what what happens when you need to professionally and gracefully fire a team member and let them know that you're no longer going to be working with them? I know that um, Katie's had to do this a time or two, and she has some really great thoughts on on how to do that gracefully and while making sure that you're not burning bridges. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I've had more experience with this than I've wanted, but that's okay. Um, so. How to professionally fire a team member really comes down to a few things. You just need to remember that your brand and your books are always going to be linked to how you treat people. So you always need to be professional, even if the person you're working with is not being professional. Um, my biggest suggestion is that you should always communicate through with team members through email so you have a record of exactly what was said and when. That can play into it huge if you're having problems later, especially with unmet expectations and money. Um, you know, something to keep in mind is having your expectations of that person clear from the very beginning will really help prevent a lot of these problems. For example, if you want a weekly update through the editing process, just make sure that's known up front. Like one of my expectations is I want an email every week or et cetera, et cetera. And then also keep in mind that you, we, we need to be patient as indies. Our lives and our books, are, our, our lives and, and our time are staked into these books, but it's a good chance that you're not the only client that this person works for. Um, so just be patient with them and understand that life happens. But also, if they say that they will deliver by a certain time, you need to be willing to say, well, this is our agreement. Um, what's going on? Let's talk about it. 
And then remember to always be good to your team members. Um, happy, team, happy team members equals unhappy in the author. Um, if people are helping you, you need to help them. And that goes a long way in maintaining good relationships with team members. However, in the next slide, slide I have an example of a email conversation I had with an editor where things didn't go so well. I've blocked her name out, and I'm not going to read this out loud, but basically what happened was I submitted a manuscript that after further study, I realized actually wasn't quite as ready for editing as I had thought. So I emailed the, um, the editor and just said, hey, I'd like to pull the manuscript. So she emailed me and said, no problem. I've done this many edits. I'll just get this to you um, like tomorrow. So I didn't get those edits. So nine days later, I emailed her, asked her for the edits again. She didn't respond. I went on vacation. When I came back, still didn't have the, the edits. Over a month later, so November 20th, I emailed her. And by the December 9th, I still had no word from her. So over two months later, I still had not received my edits. I had paid her $250 in advance. So after talking with um, one of my editors at the time and a few other authors, I came up with this email. Um, basically just said, I'm going to contact the Better Business Bureau at this, if I haven't heard from you by this day, I will notify them with this information. And I have emails to back all that information up. Well, surprisingly, she emailed me uh, later that night. So the next day, uh, I was really angry with her, to be honest, but I kept it very professional and just said, thank you so much. Glad we were able to communicate. I just like the money refund because she offered um, to either refund my money or continue with the edit. And, you know, it was fine after that. We, I haven't worked with her ever again, but I didn't need to take further action, and, and, I, and, it, and it was fine. And I think a lot of that was because I was able to step back and just not be emotional uh, regarding that particular Absolutely. thing. Um, and one more thing to keep in mind, um, you know, emails um, like, like Katie was saying back and forth, having that record, um, that does constitute an agreement that is legally enforceable. But if you have any reason to have any red flags about the professional you're working with, ask for a signed contract in writing that both of you sign that lines out all of the expectations to the letter um, and that specifies the body that you would go to for arbitration if it becomes necessary, um, just to add that extra layer of protection for you. Um, and if, if uh, a member of your team is reluctant to sign a formal contract, that's another red flag. That yeah. The consideration as you're selecting your team. Yeah. All right. So um, the next thing that we wanted to go over was something that's more on on the business side of being an independent uh, independent writer, um, which is the idea of of imprints. So Katie, um, if you could if you could take over this, um, explain a little bit what what an imprint is and why it's important. Yeah, so we decided to include imprints because it was one of the biggest questions I had when I started, and it was really difficult for me to find any information. So I kind of want to lay it out here for you guys who might be looking into independent, right, like authorship, or those of you who are indies but still don't really know what's going on because there are plenty of indies who don't know anything about this. Basically, in publishing and in, and in other things, an imprint is – um, like a niche, so to speak. It's like a branch on a tree that only blooms a certain type of flower. So this tree that I have uh, on the screen here, take it as if it were HarperCollins, one of the big five publishers. So you have all these little branches. Well, those little branches break down into one of their imprints. So they have an Avon Books imprint, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, because they produce mass market paperbacks. That's what they produce under the Avon Books imprint. They have one called Bourbon Street Books, which produces only paperback mystery lines. So they wouldn't do a romance under Bourbon Street Books unless it were somehow a paperback mystery as well. And then there's even an a imprint for Anthony Bourdain that uh, does a lot of like traveling and, and strong personality people, books about them. So you're not going to find a paperback mystery under the Anthony Bourdain imprint. For the big five publishers and big publishing companies, imprints are kind of a way to organize all their books. So they're not trying to put out all these like random categories of books under the same name. It just makes it a lot easier for them and more organized for us as uh, consumers to find what we want. So basically, as it says on the bottom, imprints are still books, 
that are just a niche, and all together they make up the whole tree, which is HarperCollins Publishing. So we're going to go into a little more detail with imprints on the next slide and talk about what this means for us as indies. There are two basic schools of thought here, um, and, and this really doesn't even encompass the whole debate of imprint versus not imprint, but we're going to go over it anyway. So you kind of have two, you have two avenues to work through here. You can form an imprint or you cannot form an imprint, and I want to go through the pros and cons. If you do form an imprint, you want to do that under a doing business as certificate or an, you want to form an LLC. Why you'd want to do that, it does seem like a bigger step and it does create a little bit more um, work at the beginning, but it really puts your brand on your books. If you have a, an actual business company, you can form this brand around it, you can do lots of stuff. Because what you're going to do when you form a DBA or an LLC is you're making your own publishing company. You are a publisher and your imprint is Antebellum Publishing, for example, that's mine. I formed an LLC. Um, last year, I believe, or two years ago, to start this um, because what I wanted was I wanted to be very organized about how I approached independent authorship. So I formed an LLC because I wanted to be able to have separate expenses, expenses, bank accounts, incomes, and tax filing for my company because to me it was my company. It wasn't. It was something separate than my regular life. Um, having an LLC or DBA, forming that business makes it so much easier to file for sales tax and use permits when you are preparing to do book signings. And as an indie, I think everyone should do book signings, although there are different schools of thought there. Um, forming an imprint will also give you greater ownership over all stages of the publishing process. You buy ISBNs under your imprint and you are listed as a publisher everywhere. It won't show Create Space. Create Space is a printer, not a publisher. Um, you can hire and fire people under your imprint. You can form bank accounts. It creates a publishing company that sets you apart from self-publishers. You are still a self-publisher because you are publishing your own stuff, but you are actually doing it under a business. So when you're at a book signing or talking to people about it, they can say, oh, who published your book? And I say, Antebellum Publishing. And I'll even just tell them it's small press. If you don't form an imprint, that's fine. What? A very small press. Yeah, it's a very small press. So they don't have to know how small the press it is. Um, you don't have to form an imprint. You you don't. So I, I'm not going to act like it's the only way to do it because lots of people don't do it. However, not having an imprint will limit bookstores from stalking you. And as indies, you should be trying to get other bookstores to stalk you. Um, when you have an imprint, you have a logo, and it goes on the back of the book. And that imprint opens a lot of doors to bookstores and book signings and other things like that. Technically, you don't even have to file an LLC or a DBA. You can just, you know, create a logo, make a name, slap on the back of the book, and say, look, this is my imprint, so you can get into bookstores. But you are still a self-publisher because you do not own a publishing business. Um, there is some discretion with people between self-publisher and indie publisher. Many will say an indie publisher is someone who is an entrepreneur who owns their own business, who runs their own publishing company, versus a self-publisher who just publishes their own books through these platforms. Um, that's not a debate we're going to get into today, but an indie publisher should take more ownership of the process, in my opinion, and be professional and, and make this work if they want it to be a long-term thing. And then with, if you don't have an imprint or a company, you can't say, have like a reassurance of quality. Like, well, this company has published these other books, which are yours, and the quality is high, so this book is probably going to be good as well. Um, for those of you who don't know what an imprint looks like, the next slide, I took a picture of the Antebellum Publishing imprint logo that I have and where it is on the back of my book. It's that tree that you saw earlier, actually. And that's what's on the website. That's what's on all my books. Um, that's what it's listed as under the ISBN, under my bank accounts, with my accountant. Everything is under Antebellum Publishing. That's a really brief overview of imprint, but um, it, it, and it can get more complicated. So what I did is I've included a list of websites with really helpful articles and, and links for you to go to in the next slide that you can screenshot and find, um, give you a little more information on imprints. One of those is from my website, kcrosswriting.com. It also has links to other articles that might help you out. Um, that 
third one, the creativeindiecovers.com is a really, really fantastic article. Um, Nina Amir at The Book Designer did a really good one. So I suggest you guys, if you have any questions, you check out these articles as well. All right, so the question that I think everyone was anxiously waiting for, um, what, what can they expect sales to look like when they're an indie writer? Yeah, so this was definitely my second biggest question when I started this, right next to how people break down their day. Um, so I've done a lot of research, talked to a lot of people to kind of get this together so we have a good, solid list here. And this is, this is kind of what I've pulled together. So in 2012, the average ebook earned $297. That is not even $300 in a year. Um, a good figure for your first month of sales for an unknown author of your very first book is about 30 sales. So if you're an indie and you've already published and you sold anywhere from 30 and above books that first month or the month following, congratulations, you are completely on the right track. Um, if you guys want to go to a great website to see a lot of detailed graphs, analysis, statistics, current market trends, that kind of stuff, authorearnings.com uh, updates it monthly. They have tons of graphs that you can geek out on because I do it all the time. Uh, I talked to some other indies uh, about their selling points and found that about one to two books per day is average for indie authors. That doesn't mean people sell less than that or that they sell more than that, but on average, from people that I've talked to, which is many, one to two books per day is, is pretty typical. However, um, there are some really big success stories, and I, and I include the next two examples to show you what you can earn as an indie. So Teresa Reagan is an, a romance author that her first month with her very first ebook earned over $500, which is fantastic. I, I just think that's a great number. And in the years following, her highest grossing month has been over $100,000. So for those of you that say there's no money in indie publishing, that is a total lie. Um, hybrid author Jesse Gage, who that. That. yeah, yeah, I mean, that's really incredible numbers. That's not necessarily what you should expect right away, but she's been working this for years and then is growing a really great name and able to pull in that much money. Um, there are hybrid authors out there. There are lots of them who do traditional publishing and indie publishing. And Jesse Gage just put out a really cool post um, this January, kind of detailing her income for last year, and just some some previews or some examples is in 2013 she sold a total of 3,699 units, meaning books, and then in 2013 by 2014 she had sold over 13,000, almost 14,000 books. So that also goes to show the more you publish, um, the more you're gonna have books to sell, and the more you're gonna sell. And I included that that blog post below so you guys can see that directly if you want to. Now that we've, we've talked about basic expectations, I want to show you guys what I earned um, as an indie with my first book, Miss Mabel. So my first six months as an indie, I've, I've put here on this chart, my, my, my release date was March 27th. So the sales in the month of March were really like a four day period and I sold 157 books just on Kindle alone. Um, this is not including Nook, paperback, um, or any of the other websites. Barnes & Noble had actually run my book on an article that, that skyrocketed my sales there for a while, so it was, it was even more, but on Kindle alone, this is, this is what I had. And you can see that as the month went on, my numbers trended downward, because what you find is you have a long tail. So you publish a book and you have a big spike in sales, and then you have this long tail that extends out afterwards. So by September, I was selling about 23 books on Amazon. That's less than one book a day. Um, so I published my second book in October of last year. I ran a BookBub ad in October for Miss Mabel's, and then that skyrocketed my sales in Amazon. So that first column where I sold 2,841, that was because of BookBub, but then I had enrolled in KDP Select, so I sold over 300 just in borrows, and then you can see that number eventually dwindling down. This, again, is just covering Miss Mabel's on Kindle, so that's not showing um, paperback or how I sold my second book, Antebellum Awakening. And really what I want to teach here is that if you want to sell more books, you need to write more books. Um, you can't sell what isn't written, essentially. So getting the books out there is really, really important. Um, sometimes, sometimes with um, when you release uh, a second or third book in the series, the the buzz that you create around the second book can help you sell a lot more of the first book as well. So it, it really, yeah. it, it snowballs on itself. 
definitely. So now that you guys have kind of seen these numbers, uh, I'll show you my overall numbers for my first year. In my total units sold in 2014, I started selling my first book in, in March, so this is about nine months worth. I sold about 6,500 units. That's paperback, um, ebook, all that book signings. It, it, it rounded out to a little over 6,500. Uh, my accountant is actually going over that figure because I missed a bunch, so it might be even closer to 7,000, but we'll just take it to 6,500. My total earnings were about $7,000. I published two books, one novella. I went to two writer's conferences that year, and I built three websites. So if anyone's kind of curious about my first nine months, my first year in indie, that's kind of what it looks like briefly. So on the next slide, we're going to show you a few tips on um, – how you can help boosting sales. I mean, we could do an entire webinar on this alone, but I'm just gonna give you a few of my thoughts. So first of all, um, you need to embrace the fact that slumps happen to everyone. It, it just does. Like the traditional best-selling authors have slumps. Theirs are probably sometimes a little bit different than ours, but everyone has slumps. Um, I already said it, the single best way to sell your book is to publish another one. However, if sales have remained low for a while, you might wanna reevaluate a few things. Uh, look at your book cover. Does it look professional? Does it appear self-published or subpar? What you can really do for yourself is put these things to total unbiased people, people you don't know, and get their opinion. Like, what do you honestly think of my book cover? If you do this, be ready for honest feedback, but you need honest feedback to excel in this sphere. Um, another thing to do is try new search terms or categories on the, on, the book, on the websites you have your books listed. Sometimes you might not have the right search terms that aren't getting to people. Uh, you can also rewrite the blurb. It might not have been catchy enough. A lot of um, the book cover is the first thing that catches the reader's eye, but the blurb is what will sell them on whether they want to buy the book. So make sure that that's a, a really well edited and, and well written, engaging blurb. And if those, if you know those things are all online, you're still in the slump, really frustrated, try out an email subscription website like BookBub, BookDaily, or BookBear. Be warned that BookBub is notoriously difficult to get on. Um, you typically need over 50 reviews with an average of four star, and they can be really expensive, but you almost always make your money back on a book bub. Book Daily, I haven't um, worked with on my own or Book Bear, but Book Gorilla, I have worked with, and they did a promo for me last January that only cost me $35 that I made. I made that money back and more, so that's just another idea to kind of get your book back up in rankings again. Absolutely. And I really wanted to uh, emphasize the, the point that Katie made about having a professional book cover. Um, you know, I, I always tell my clients that good editing is what keeps your reader um, pushing through to the end of your book. But having good cover art is often the difference between whether they'll even open your book or not. Um, you know, we, we have all learned the cliche from the time we were very young that we should not judge a book by its cover, but we all do it. And oh, uh -huh. so, and so if, um, you know, if you have cover art that looks professional, that draws the reader in, then you're a lot more likely to have good book sales. So don't, uh, don't underestimate the importance of cover art. All right. So now I wanted to wrap up um, by talking a little bit about social media marketing and what that means for you as an indie author. Um, I know that, that Katie and I have, have talked a little bit about this, and we know that trying to set out to conquer social media can be really overwhelming. Um, and it, it can be even more overwhelming when you realize that you're going to have to do most of the managing of your social media presence by yourself. And that goes whether you're an indie author or whether you're pursuing a traditional publishing contract. More and more, the expectation is that um, that even traditionally published authors will do um, a, a lot, maybe even most of the legwork for getting the word about their book out there. Um, and we, we know that it all sounds overwhelming, so we wanted to just give you a few tips to make it a little bit easier and hopefully demystify it a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So basically with social media, which could be 10,000 webinars and still not cover it, um, as Catherine said, just be aware that whether you're into your traditional, you're going to have to manage your own social media presence. And I think that's a good thing. I don't think you should ever hire someone else to represent you on social media. You should always represent yourself to your fans. Um, but one thing that we, we need to face as indies is that if we want to succeed, then we need to learn social media. And I'm not telling you to 
um, memorize and be like a superpower on every single social media website because that's not going to happen. There's like 800 social media websites that are active right now. But there are a few tips and a few things you can be aware of to kind of help you out with that. And we'll go through that now. So the next slide is going to show you um, just like a real quick little graph to give you a few quick statistics to warm you up to social media. Um, Facebook has just millions and millions of users, but one thing that is really interesting to know is that 189 million Facebook users only use it on their cell phones. They're mobile only, like iPads, cell phones, all that stuff. So don't discount the power of cell phones anymore. Um, right now, 93% of marketers use social media for their business. So everyone is using social media to work their business. Um, uh, as of this poll that I give you the I give you the link if you want to check it out. 23% of Facebook users are on their Facebook profile or account more than five times every day, and I think it's fair to say that some of them are probably on it constantly, upwards of 20 to 30 times a day. So the power of social media is huge for visibility. If you want to be seen, we need to be where they are. Um, and then 80% of users actually prefer to connect with brands through Facebook. So if there's like a restaurant they want to go to, they're going to look for it on Facebook. Or if there's like a brand of jeans they want to try, they're going to go to Facebook to find that brand of jeans and figure out if they want to get it. Uh, this graph basically just shows that social media is not just a young adult platform anymore either. So for those of you who aren't writing teens for teenagers, that's fine because what we're seeing right now is a huge growth in adults who are on social media websites by year and not just Facebook. Already we have 67 to 71% of adults on Facebook, but we're seeing more on LinkedIn, more on Pinterest, more on Instagram, and more on Twitter every single year. So there's no reason for you to feel like your people aren't on social media right now. Absolutely. I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that I'm probably in that group of Facebook users that checks the account more than five times a day. Um, <laughs> um, so when you're when you're developing your social media platform, um, the the biggest thing to remember is that um, you're you're on the platform to connect with your readers, not to just advertise them, advertise to them. Um, if you want to um, see more people coming to your page, more people interacting with your page, um, you have to be really proactive about building a culture um, around the things that they want to talk about. Um, I was at a conference a little over a month ago, a writer's conference, um, where a social media expert named Sandy Krakowski um, did a presentation. And um, I've really liked a lot of things that she has to say. Um, she Her website's at arealchange.com. Um, and she she has a lot of a lot of great tips that she offers for free. She does have some paid classes you can do, um, but I've learned a lot just by by following her, by watching the the way that she interacts with her fans, um, and she does an excellent job at building that culture that that brings people to her Facebook page, to her Twitter feed, um, and she does this by not just always advertising about you know, the book she's written or about the products she's selling, um, but by interacting on a personal level with her readers and by talking about what the readers in her niche really want to talk about. Um, and that is is really the key to getting getting people to come back, is not just tooting your own horn, not just advertising yourself, but also by engaging in conversations with people. Um, in regards to posting frequency, um, you definitely can post more on Facebook than you think that you can. And the reason for this is the thing that we all like to complain about, which is Facebook's algorithm. The algorithm is the <laughs> magical little thing that determines the number of people that will see any particular post you send out. Um, and instead of, instead of spending our days complaining about how the algorithm decided that our most recent Facebook post should only be sent out to eight of our 142 fans. Um, what we've done instead is upped our posting frequency, which means that even though you know maybe one uh, one post will only be seen by um, eight people or 24 people or 48 people, um, if we post quite a number of times in a day, um, it's going to be seen by a lot more than that. Um, when I was first starting out, I was really nervous that if I posted more than one or two or three times in a day, that I would alienate people, that they would get tired of seeing um, seeing Quill Pen's brand on Facebook, 
and that they would um, hide all of our posts, that they would unfollow us. Um, what I started doing after listening to some of Sandy Krakowski's talks was greatly um, increasing the number of times we posted. We now generally try to post to both Facebook and Twitter um, in the seven to 10 times a day range. And what happened, we saw our engagement skyrocket, um, we saw our post reach skyrocket, and it, it was a much more effective way to do social media. Um, and the, the other thing with that, the, the way to beat the algorithm and get your content out to more people is to produce content that people want to interact with. Um, Facebook will show your post to more people if the people that have already seen it are going to hit that like button, if they're going to comment on it, if they're going to share it. So definitely you want to make sure that you have really engaging content um, and that it's, it's about what people want to talk about. The other thing I would say um, is if you have a um, professional page, a business page, um, make use of the Insights tab on Facebook. And there's, there's a similar Creatives tab on Twitter. That you, that you can find if you have a business Twitter. Um, but if you go to your business page, um, you'll, you'll see these, um, these five tabs at the top. And the fourth tab over is called Insights. I, I have it here um, screenshotted on the slide for you. If you click that, you'll be able to see all kinds of information that will really let you know if what you're doing is working. And you'll be able to see the number of people that your posts have reached in the last week, the amount of engagement you've had, what type of engagement, and you'll even be able to see the negative engagement you've had. Um, you'll be able to see how many people unsubscribed, what day they unsubscribed. You'll be able to see how many people hid one of your posts um, or hid all of your posts out of their feed permanently. And um, you can also see an individual breakdown of how well your different posts are doing, how much engagement they're getting. Um, so that you can test things. Um, you can see what types of content that your readers like, and you can see um, you can see what times of day you get the most interaction with. So definitely make use of that as you're building your social media strategy. And to kind of go along with what Catherine has said here, um, I, I wanted to include a slide on how to do social media well, because we could talk about how not to do social media or, or what you should do or all that stuff. But it really comes down to a few key principles. And that's kind of what I have here. 80% um, of your interaction on social media should be about others and 20 about 20% 20 about yourself. So for example, for every 10 tweets that are sent out by in your Twitter account, only like two of them should be your content and eight should be either interacting with others on their content or sharing other people's content like blog posts or books or giveaways or whatever that means for you that you and your followers will like. Social media is about being social. So you aren't going to like hog all the attention or at a movie or dinner and make everything about yourself because that would you wouldn't have any friends. So we don't want to do that here on social media. Uh, something that wasn't really all that clear to me at the beginning uh, was that social media takes time and persistence, especially if you are a strong presence. It's definitely not going to happen overnight. And you can't expect to log on to Pinterest every two weeks, pin a bunch, and then can't figure out why you have any followers. If you're not consistent and constantly either putting out content or finding great content, it's just not going to happen. And the other big mistake I see with indies is that we are so focused on helping each other that all of our social media presence is other indies. And that's the problem because indies are not your audience. Um, people are your audience. People buy your books, not just indies. So you need to bring people who aren't necessarily other authors to your page or your profile or your board by starting a conversation or doing something that would interest people outside of authorship. Um, this draws attention to you eventually it draws attention to your brand and eventually to your content and your book and over time this pays off in exposure and it will eventually lead to sales because you'll then have a strong social media presence so basically i just want you to involve yourself outside of author stuff so i took screenshots of a couple of my favorite pinterest boards that i run to give you an example so i have two separate food um, boards because I'm obsessed with food and Pinterest is like food porn seriously so I have a board for food that I obviously could never make and probably wouldn't eat because it's really unhealthy but I just love to look at <laughs> and then food that I would actually cook and eat and that's the nom noms board 
Um, I love Wattpad, especially since I joined it and I've seen a lot of success there lately. So I have a Wattpad Wonders Board where other stories that I find and read that I love, I will pin there for other Wattpad users like, oh, well, here's some vetted examples because Wattpad has some scary stories that aren't really very good. Um, I'm a real, my husband and I are really big hikers. We are always in the mountains. I hike every single day with my dogs. And it turns out that I, I get some really cool pictures. So I share those on Pinterest and on Instagram. So I have a board scenes from my hikes. But I also, and I have two Vishlas that are the loves of my life. I'm obsessed with them. So I have a separate Pinterest board just for my dogs and for other Vishla lovers and dog lovers to come look at. But amongst all those, I also have a board for my first book, Miss Mabel School for Girls. So anyone who wants to follow these other boards will, if they follow all my boards so they don't miss any of my stuff, they will also be following my Miss Mabel School for Girls board, which will slip in a few, like maybe they'll see my new book covers or they'll find out it's on sale or something great happened. And that will eventually, they'll see it, at least exposure, and eventually might get them to buy it. Um, so on the next slide, I want to show you real quick some suggestions for actually encouraging interaction and conversation on social media. And it, it revolves around the same prospect of just not focusing only on you and you being an author. So up on the left, um, I have this, this one website I'm obsessed with. It's gi365.info, and her food is phenomenal. She eats clean, um, and she just has the best recipes. And so I'm always sharing. That's really good. I know. I, 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 every time I look at this presentation, I just want to eat those again. Um, so I like to share, oh, well, look, this is what I'm going to have for dinner tonight. And people start talking like, oh, my gosh, it looks so good. Where'd you get it? Or I've made that recipe before, and it's terrible. And people start talking. Uh, another really big hike that I did, um, I did it when I was 17 weeks pregnant. It's a really intense hike. It's that line kind of down the middle of the mountain. It's 2,000 feet in a mile. It's basically all stairs. So I put that out to talk to other people who love hiking or who've been pregnant and tried to exercise type thing. And then right below that, ever since I've been pregnant, I am seriously obsessed with mustard. I just eat it on everything. I totally gross my husband out. And within like an hour of putting that up, I had 42 comments and all these people asking, like I like people putting up pictures of them eating mustard or getting into discussions about mustard. And a lot of people that never comment on my stuff started commenting on it because they apparently have something to say about mustard, which is exactly what I want. I just want to bring people to my, my profile. And then right next to that, on the bottom left, um, I had a book club in Pennsylvania, I think. I'm, I'm not even sure. Um, do Miss Mabel School for Girls for their book. And I was so excited because one of the, the organizers actually emailed me to see if I would do a Skype session, which I was absolutely happy to do. So they actually went all out and they had matching outfits and they did cinnamon rolls and decorations and they had a they had a girl dress up as Miss Mabel and all this stuff. So I followed this girl on Instagram and saw her post this and I was so excited about it that I shared it with my Facebook friends and I actually had a lot of people um, excited about that and commenting on it. And then some people were even excited like, oh, you'll Skype book sessions, will you do it for my book club? So the way it was a way to get um, interaction going, but also to get people to realize, oh, well, well, she does this as an author, maybe I could get her to do it for us. So it is another extension of my brand. So social media can be really fun. That's what I want people to understand is it doesn't just have to be about your book. Social media should definitely be about more than your book. It should be about your life, really. Absolutely. By the way, uh, that book club looks so fun. I, I think I want to join them. I know. They were they were a blast. I think there was like 15 girls there, and we just had so much fun. It was so much fun. So um, just to, to finish up here, I included a few people, and there's one missing, but um, – and it's Erica Clay, but I included a few people here that I follow on Twitter and other social media like blogs. I think I follow all of these blogs um, because I have learned a lot from these people. So I've learned how to do social media by watching other people who do social media well. Um, Christina, she runs, a, she's a Catholic mom and wife, and she runs this fantastic blog. She's a master at Pinterest. I have really learned Pinterest because of her, so she's helped me out a lot. Um, you should definitely join her her follow her on Twitter and then find her blog. And she actually gives away this how to, this Pinterest kind of seminar thing that you've got to see. Natalie um, is a social media guru that I follow her website because she's always posting stuff. She introduced me to StumbleUpon and she has posts that have gone viral on StumbleUpon that have just been awesome. And then Erica Clay is supposed to be there in that right corner. 
she um, has run Tipsy Lit, and she just does all social media at, like outlets so stinking well that I'm following her on all of them just to figure out how she does it and how she gets my interest every time. And then below them are some really well-known names in indie publishing or just publishing in general. Kristen Lamb is a fantastic um, social media Jedi, as she says herself. Her book, um, uh, Rise of the Machines, Human Authors in a Digital World, is a must-read for indie 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 any indie author that wants to learn social media. Joanna Penn, I can't even say enough about her in social media. And then Kate, Kate Weiland, she does a fantastic blog all the time on just how to write, um, structuring your novel, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I definitely suggest that you follow that Helping Writers Become Authors if you have any questions about blogging or writing in general. I definitely have to second that recommendation of Kate um, Weiland's blog. She, oh, um, I'm messing up this. Um, she has published some really fabulous articles that I recommend to a lot of my clients. Can I get this to work? I'm being overly yeah. enthusiastic with the mouse. There we go. All right. Um, so after after all of this, you know, indie publishing is such such a big topic, such a big conversation, and we're sure that you still have questions running through your mind. Um, we wanted to make ourselves available to answer those questions. Feel free to contact us. Um, we have my email address first on there um, and Katie's email address underneath. Um, we, would, we would love to point you to additional resources for, for any questions that you have. Um, and, you know, if you, if you have a novel that you're thinking about shopping around for an editor, I'd love to take a look at it. Uh, oh, and I can vouch for Catherine. She is the single best editor I've ever had. And I've worked with other editors at Quilton Editorial, and I've, I've never, ever been let down. So I recommend Catherine to everyone, seriously. Aw, thanks, Katie. And um, Katie has also, she's, um, she's shown herself very willing to help um, other indie writers. She's fabulous. If you haven't bought Miss Mabel's School for Girls yet, you really need to go do that because it's absolutely fabulous. It is. I, I really love her series. I'm I'm probably not objective enough about her series, <laughs> but um, but you should go you should go do that. Look at her pretty new pretty new cover art, um, and definitely check out her Wattpad novel as well. So yes, thank you guys all so much for um, for coming out for listening to this. Um, we we really appreciate um, that that you stuck with us through this whole thing. Um, and again, do, do let us know if you have any questions. We'd love to chat with you. Have a wonderful rest of your day.